All right, it's time to go to work. Grab your Bibles, grab your pens. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. This is what I want you to do. I want you, as I read this historical event, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You're following Jesus. You're seeing Jesus do incredible things. And as you go on this journey with him, Jesus does something remarkable. So imagine that you are there. Think about the emotions that you're going to be going through. Think about what you are experiencing, what you're seeing, okay? Because this is pretty powerful. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, Jesus and his disciples. Jesus got out of a boat, and man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man, he lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore, tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day and among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and he would cut himself with stones okay so you're a disciple you just arrived on the other side of the lake you're following jesus and you notice that you arrive and there's a cemetery off in the distance and all of a sudden you see someone coming from the cemetery it says that he's so strong that no one can bind him no longer with chain on his wrists and his feet he was so strong he would tear him apart not only that it said that he cut himself with stones this man is a wreck this man is desperate this man is in pain this man doesn't like what's inside of him so he's cutting himself so when you look at this man you got to think of this man as being not well kept. He lives in the tombs. He has scars all over his body. He probably has open wounds. This man is struggling. And you as a disciple, you look over and you see this man coming towards you. What would you be thinking? As a disciple, my immediate thought would be, let's get back on the boat. Let's back off, right? But then you notice Jesus stepping forward. Notice what happens next. Starting in verse 9, this is what it says. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him he shouted at the top of his voice what do you want with me jesus son of the most high god swear to god that you won't torture me for jesus had said to him come out of this man you evil spirit time i pause we need to unpack this okay this demonic man runs to jesus and bows before him and screams at the top of his lung and he says don't torture me we should check this out okay this jesus of history has authority over demons and they are frightened because of his power. You are there as a disciple and you're seeing what's taking place. A man that is cut, he has scars all over his body, he lives in the tomb, you're an eyewitness of what's taking place. This demon-possessed man bows before Jesus, screams at the top of his lungs, and notice the conversation as it unfolds. Verse 9, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. Okay, Jesus, ah, he has authority. Ah. And it says, the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and they were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus, please leave our region. Okay. Let's unpack this. Yeah. Scholars believe that a legion of demons in this particular man is the same amount of number of a legion of, of soldiers in a Roman army. 6,000, 4 to 6,000. So imagine if you would, this demon-possessed man has 6,000 demons waging war inside of his body. Makes sense why he's super strong. Jesus comes on the scene. He does something phenomenal. He literally restores his life. He pulls the demons out of him. They bow down to Jesus. He removes them, throws them into pigs. And then later on, it says the whole countryside came to hear what was taking place. And when they saw the man dressed in his right mind, they were frightened. They recognized who this dude was. They tried to bind him in the past. It was a problem to society. They kind of made him just go stay in the tomb, stay away from us. They can identify who this guy is. They knew they couldn't do anything for him, so he just needs to leave town. This man named Jesus comes on the scene, has a conversation, and fixes the problem. There's a problem taking place. They don't know what to do with him. Jesus restores him and transforms him. And it says they're all frightened because they were eyewitnesses to see the aftermath of Jesus' power. It tells us that Jesus restored him back in his right mind. Years ago, I used to work in a machine shop and I worked with convicted felons. Within that machine shop with those convicted felons, I got to know their story. And I realized over and over and over again that Satan and sin ruins lives. This man was demon possessed. His life was a wreck. Satan and sin ruins lives. Jesus and his spirit restores lives. It's a counter. You have evil over here wreaking havoc. Jesus is over here saying, hey, I can change things. 
I can push the darkness back. So think of it like this. This demon-possessed man, before he knew Jesus, what was his life like? His life was a wreck. He was in pain. He was cutting himself with stones. After he got to know Jesus and after Jesus transformed his life, what was his life like? He says he was in his right mind. It's like he was happier. He told everybody about how God had mercy on him. Before Jesus, what was his life like? After Jesus, what was his life like? Now, the question I want you to be thinking about is this, as you're going on this journey with me, is what is your identity? Ephesians chapter 2. Paul's talking to the Ephesian church and he's reminding them of who they once were. There was a condition of these people outside Christ. This is who they once were. This is what this was their identity before they got to know Jesus. Check this out. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work of those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Paul is telling the Ephesians this. He said, you were at one time dead in your sin because of your actions and your choices. Because of free will, we chose to do evil. We were deceived, manipulated because of our actions. We were dead and we were producing more death. And then he says... Because of our sinful desires, we're gratifying the sins of our sinful nature. So every thought and desire we chased after. When the Ephesians were being talked to by Paul, he said, this was your former identity. Everything you were doing was objects of wrath. The things that you did, the lifestyle you lived. So not only were they dead in their sin, gratifying the sinful nature, they were producing and leaving a legacy of evil. Because that was their nature. They were overflowing with evil. And Paul was saying, this is who you once were outside Christ before you got to know Jesus. Think of the demon-possessed man. Before he knew Jesus, what was his life like? He was dead in sin. He was gratifying the sinful nature. He was by nature object of wrath. He was producing evil. He was causing ruckus, causing problems. He wasn't building lives. He was destroying lives, right? So Paul talking to the Ephesians, he says, this is who you once were outside of Christ. Then let's keep going. In verse 4 through 7, it says... But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his uh, kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So this is what Paul is saying to the Ephesian church. Before you knew Jesus, this was your identity. Objects of wrath gratifying the sinful nature, and you were dead in your sin. But because of God, because of what he did, because of his work, because of his love, right? It says that he made us alive. We were no longer dead, but alive because of what God did. The demon-possessed man. If Jesus had not removed the demons from his life, what would his current state be? Desperation. He would still be stuck in desperation and pain wickedness producing evil if it wasn't for jesus that stepped in his life removed the evil took care of what was going on he wouldn't have been in his right mind that's what paul's talking about to the ephesians before they knew jesus this is their lifestyle after they got to know jesus this is their lifestyle because of what jesus has done because of god's great mercy pouring out on them satan and sin produces what pain evil ruckus craziness Jesus and his spirit, what do they produce? Unity, love, restoration. Oh, I love God so much. Jesus is a man we can follow. Jesus is a man that we can build our lives around. Jesus is a man that we can say, you know what? I want to know him. I want to discover him. I want to know what he's about. I want to see what he's about because there's avalanches of historical content that remind us over and over and over again that Jesus and his nature is he desires to restore mankind. If you were to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that he's about helping people overcome. We are overcomers because of Jesus. I'll give you another example. Go over to Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 21. Paul is talking to the Colossian church, and he's, he's saying to this church, this is who you once were. And because of Jesus, this is who you are now. Check this out. Verse 21, this is what it reads. Once you were alienated from God. And you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So Paul's saying to the Colossian church, at one particular time, you were alienated from God. You were enemies of God because of your evil behavior. Let's reverse engineer it. Because of our, their evil behavior, their lifestyle, their practices, they were enemies of God. 
And because of that, they were alienated from God. It wasn't God pushing them away. It was them and their lifestyle. In 1 John, it talks about that God is light in him. There's no darkness. He wants us to be with him, but he can't have fellowship with darkness. And Paul's saying before you knew Jesus, because of your lifestyle, your nature, the evil that you were doing, your behaviors, right? You were choosing to fight against God. Time out, pause. When we talked about this demon-possessed man earlier, when he saw who Jesus was, he came and bowed down before Jesus. There was respect there, and he knew, the demons knew who was in through true authority, right? They bowed down and said, huh, don't torture us, Jesus, right? So when Paul's talking to the Colossians, he says, when you live in a rebellious lifestyle, you're lifting your fist as an enemy of God. Time out, pause. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an enemy of God. Why? When I look at that sun, and I know that God created that sun, God's all powerful. I want to be on his team. I want to be bowing down, worshiping him, as opposed to lifting a sword, fighting him. Uh-uh, not me, not me. Check out verse 22. It says, but now, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. So Paul's saying to the Colossians, he says, at one particular time, outside of Christ, this is who you are. This was your condition. You're enemies of God because of your behavior. Then he says, but because of Jesus and because of God, because of what they have done, they reconciled you back into relationship with the Father. God's heart is a Father saying, no, come back. Come be with me, right? And then it says, but because of Jesus, because of God, because of their love, we have an opportunity to come back into fellowship with the Father. Notice verse 23, it says, you need to continue in the faith. You need to stay true to being a disciple of Jesus and walking with Jesus. Before this demon-possessed man got to know Jesus, what was his life like? He was a wreck. He was desperate. He was cutting himself with stones because he didn't like what was inside. Jesus comes on the scene and he literally transforms his life. Who was this man after he got to know Jesus? After he allowed Jesus to transform him? He was in his right mind. He was in a better condition than he was outside of Christ. Remember, sin and Satan produces evil. Look at the world. What's the root of sin? Selfishness. There's problems everywhere. Jesus comes on the scene. He says, let's follow me. Let's get into God's kingdom. Let's have the spirit transform us for the good, right? So before Jesus, think about the condition of this man. And after Jesus, think about the condition of this man. Same thing for the Ephesians. Same thing for the Colossians. Before they knew Jesus, they had a certain mindset, certain state in the relationship with God. After they got to know Jesus, they were transformed. They were different. Go over to Galatians chapter 3 because I want to share a verse that's very powerful and significant. Chapter 3, starting verse 26. This is what it reads. It says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is so important. Faith, faith. we got to have faith. Build your life around Jesus. Believe in him, right? And it says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is significant. Okay, this is powerful. It says, we are clothed in Christ, meaning we are forgiven of sin. We die to ourselves. We're given the Holy Spirit. Go on the journey with me, okay? You're on the judgment seat, and the Father, God, is on the throne, and it's judgment day. So you're sitting there. Your accuser, Satan, comes and he reveals everything you have done. Every deep, dark, evil, wicked thing that you have hidden, that you've lied about, and every dark thing that you've done, he exposes it in front of everybody. You're known for this. You've done this. You've done this. You've done that. He's exposing everything, and it leaves you in shame. It leaves you in guilt. He literally opens up your life and reveals every evil, wicked thing you have done, and the Father's looking at you. Judgment is coming, and you feel shameful. You feel guilty and thinking, I'm responsible for my actions. And all of a sudden, Jesus, your advocate comes on the scene. He says, but he's clothed in my name. She's clothed in my name. So when God looks at us because of what Jesus did, our faith, we're baptized to be clothed in his likeness. God doesn't identify us as our evil behaviors, but because of Jesus and what he did on that cross, he views us as holy, free from accusation. This is so significant because of what Jesus did. God views us differently. Just like Paul was saying to the Colossians, before you knew Jesus, this is who you were. After you got to know Jesus, this is who you are. Same thing for the Colossians. Before, after, the demon-possessed the demon man, before and after. So you might be thinking, Tony, what's the point of all this? My question is, what is your identity? In Christ, who are we? Sinner saved by grace, wrecked in his love. I'm saved because of what Jesus did outside of Christ. Who are we? 
by nature we're objects of wrath and we're contributing to the pain and the evil in the world. God views us differently because of what Jesus has done. First Peter chapter two, this is what Peter's saying to, to the saints, to disciples of Jesus. He says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Peter's saying, this is who you are because of what Jesus has done, because of your faith and you're clothed in his likeness, because of baptism. God views you differently that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this wonderful life. Man, we are sinners saved by grace and we get to praise God and we get to talk about God and point people to, to Jesus. Because of Jesus, we have a new identity. Because of Jesus, we are free from sin. Because of Jesus, we have a second chance at life to do things right. Because of Jesus, he restores us. We're no longer objects of wrath. We're no longer enemies of God. I don't want to be an enemy of God. Do you want to be an enemy of God? The goal is this. Because of what Jesus has done, we get to stand free from sin. Worshiping the Father in heaven said, thank you because of what you have done. Remember, Jesus has done amazing things for us and we get to celebrate because of what he has done. Because of Jesus and his spirit, we are holy and set apart, free from accusation because of what Jesus has done. When we understand our identity in Christ, we can't help but celebrate him. So here's your challenge. Think about this. Whenever you wake up in the morning, your feet hit the ground. Remember who you are and who you represent. We're the child of the Most High God. Make sure you're a child of the Most High God. Get on his team. Be on his team, right? Don't oppose him. Walk with him. And wherever you go, disciples of Jesus, stand with your head held high, knowing who you are and whose you are because of what Jesus has done. Keep seeking him. Keep building your life around him. The world is going to hit you hard. Let's keep staring it, okay? Build your life around Jesus. I hope you guys are encouraged. Keep growing your faith. Love you, and I'll talk to you soon.